Great. Um, well, thank you for letting me join. My name is Sierra Ladisaw, and I work at Cushing Memorial Library and Archives at Texas A&M University, um, where I am a curator. I am the curator of the MAPS collection, um, which is where the maps that are in this scavenger hunt come from. I'm also the curator for digital scholarship, our maritime collection, um, and I'm the co-curator for the Chapman Texas and Borderlands collection. And so this project kind of came as a like stress point of need. I annually, typically during the summer, but also at other times throughout the year, find ways to partner with my colleagues at the public library system. So the Bryan College Station Public Library System has three branches. There is the Ringer Library, which is in College Station and serves that kind of College Station community. The Clara B. Muntz Library, which is in Bryan, which is the kind of um, counterpart to the Ringer. And then there is also the Carnegie History Library, which is our old Carnegie Library, um, and it is devoted to local history and genealogy. Um, and so I've done a lot of projects with all three of these different groups. Um, and something I've done several times that's always been a hit is I've taken maps from our Maps of Imaginary Places collection and done um, something during summer reading. And so the Maps of Imaginary Places collection is a joint effort between myself and the curator of the science fiction and fantasy research collection. Um, and so the maps are all maps that depict unreal locations. So it's probably one of my favorite parts of my job is working with these and it's what I do a lot of my research and publishing on. So these are maps showing places in television and movies, comic books, novels, um, video games, tabletop games, and even things that are allegorical, so like the map of love or the map of stress. Um, and so then we also have things that we're kind of calling um, these maps that look at not necessarily places, but ideas. So like a map of zombies. So what would a zombie being mapped look like, which I'll be able to show you because that is one of the maps we've included in the scavenger hunt. So what I had planned for this summer was to do the simple where I pull a handful of maps, I go to the public library, we set it up and I interact with the children. What we take, because these are special collection maps, are duplicate copies that we own, so that we have our archival copy that can be safe and preserved, and then the one that can go out and about in tubes and get a little damaged and banged up. Thankfully, a lot of these objects are quite inexpensive. They're modern stuff being produced by artists currently, and you buy them through their Etsy shop or their Redbubble shop. So the whole collection is about 300 items now, and it's often difficult to do anything digital with it because so much of it is under copyright. So that was one of our first concerns when having to quickly convert our in-person event into a digital one due to COVID, was what maps could we use? Um, so clearly I then had to go out and seek copyright permission. Um, there were some artists who were very happy to let us use their maps. Um, there were artists that wanted to let us use their maps, but with stipulations. Um, so when it came down to it, I ended up with two that are modern works that are currently under copyright that I have permission from the artists because we were unable to turn off that download feature for visitors to the page. So what I ended up doing was using Spotlight to create this exhibit. It was a really quick creation. It's probably not the most polished thing you have seen in one of these showings, but it was a really uh, nice example of how you can turn something around using the Spotlight platform as a single individual user, essentially overnight. So, to start with, we had our simple landing page um, using the official summer reading program logo, which I also had to get permission to use because Texas a and is not part of the summer reading program, um, but they were nice enough to grant us the permission to use their logo. I worked directly with the public services, their youth librarian at the public library, and she wrote a lot of the text you see throughout this. Um, so it's an incredibly simple landing page with a little bit of a um, directions. And then we get into our maps. There's a page for each individual map. The zombie one, by far one of the most popular maps in the collection. Um, Jason Bradley Thompson is an incredible artist. If you have free time and like to look at some very whimsical pop culture art, I recommend checking him out. Um, he was kind enough to write me an artist statement to include with the image. And then at the bottom are these really fun um, scavenger hunt clues that Jenny at the public library wrote for each map. And they vary for each individual map because the idea was we would have a map that was intended for the younger children to look at. So it has very, very easy clues. It's an easy map to look at. And I'll show you that one in just a second. It's the Wizard of Oz map. Um, but this one was meant for like the upper age teenagers, so high school aged. And when we go to the actual map and get our zoom in, what you'll see is this is more of a flow chart 
that will get you to different types of zombies at the end of these tendrils of the nervous system. So you start in the middle with, if I shoot the zombie in the chest with the shotgun, does it die? And you follow out and you go down these long paths, then you'll end up at a zombie from a very specific um, work, whether it's a movie, a television show, um, a video game, comic book, anything like that. And so the artist did some really wonderful <laughs> um, work in watching and interacting with all of these um, different properties to identify the zombies. And so, you know, it's what you would expect at zooming in and zooming out. It's really nice. And this is where we actually had a little bit of problem with getting that copyright permission was because this is becoming something that's a very high quality digital reproduction of their artwork that they're currently using to fund their lives, right? This is how they make their living. And so we wanted to make sure that we were 100% within copyright and we had that permission from those users or those creators. Oh, I stopped sharing, sorry. Um, how do I now get out of this with this screen up? There we go. So there was a several other maps we used. Something that was kind of an interesting part of this was because we were doing this during COVID, I was not able to go in and scan maps I didn't already have scans of. So the ancient map of Fairyland, it's a pretty famous map. Um, this was one of our ones that we did for adults. Um, I ended up actually using the Library of Congress's digital copy because they had an example online. But I made sure for every map I chose that we did physically own a copy ourselves. Um, so the Wizard of Oz map I was talking about here, nice, easy, simple. You could see how this would be appropriate for a small child to discover from the clues um, what color or where the munchkins live. Um, and so we wanted it to go across our age ranges. So the Oz map was meant for like those real young, just learning to read, pre-K, kindergarten age. We had the Adventures and Voyages map, which charts fantastical exploration and real people exploration. So this was like our middle school age map. Um, you get Texas became a state, um, but Captain Kids Island, where Treasure Island took place, material like that. And you'll see when we come down to these ones, the questions are a little bit harder and some of them are put more like a riddle again. So this was kind of a nice opportunity to do something digital with the public library. And then our about gives a little bit about each library and then the contact information for each of the librarians that worked on this project. We have, you know, a lot of lessons learned. <laughs> um, one thing was, if we do this again, we want to make sure we have some kind of better outreach about it. Um, so it was linked from the summer reading program and they actually linked it from the top of the public libraries page. Um, our libraries tweeted about it. And then the, uh, I don't, so our libraries tweeted about it. And then Beth German was kind enough to also run analytics. We could see how many people visited. We got a couple spikes on the days, of course, that like tweets went out or that there would be a media blast. Um, but overall, the, the people who interacted with it was a lower than what we were hoping for. Um, but from talking with the public library, seemed to be pretty good for the amount of people that they would normally have come in for a single event. So when they would have an in-person event, which would be about a day long um, or half a day, they would get between five and 600 people. So we had this up and we've done our you know three weeks here of data and we had about half that number of page viewers. So that was still a positive response. Some of the stuff that was interesting in trying to collaborate with the public library was the fact that I needed to, they don't have that access. We did not set up access for them to come in and make any edits or change. And when I got to working with their librarians loved it, their librarians loved it. Then the bosses of the library loved it and the you know, director of the library loved it. And then I got to their IT department and there were some issues there. Where we had to do a lot of kind of tweaking and changes to fit their accessibility standards um, that I didn't think would be all that different from ours. Um, and for the most part, it was just little tweaks about language or length of um, descriptive text on images, stuff like that. And then on the back end, this is exactly what you would expect it to be, right? That was not the right button. Thought I knew the right button. Here we go, exhibit dashboard. I am still a novice user with Spotlight. <laughs> this is really my first live exhibit. Um, we have each of our images. They have their metadata. It's fully done. Um, here, we'll view this guy. 
Um, this was another one that came with an artist permission to use. Um, we tried to do tags so that they could be searched and we ended up getting rid of that view them all at once search area by request of the public libraries because they found that would be confusing for their users. And so that was kind of something for me that was an interesting way of having to look at developing was how the other spotlight exhibits I've been working on, how we develop and curate for an academic audience versus what we're developing and curating for this kind of public audience, especially when it's going to be a lot of children um, or adults who just need to come and go and put their kid down in front of the computer or they themselves might not be um, used to working with this sort of technology. So for me, what seems incredibly intuitive, I click the little expandy box and it pops open. Our um, counterparts at the public library were concerned about whether or not the older audience or the younger audiences would have that intuitive interaction with a web-based product. Um, so that was one of those that gave me a lot of thoughts about how do I want to design this and it started out with much more here and we kept skimming it back until we thought that it would be the easiest possible way for the audience to interact. And so kind of past this and looking to the future, this project was meant to be a timely piece. So it won't stay up permanently. That was not the intention of it. Um, it is a little rough because it was a point of need creation. We are looking at what are things we can do this way in the future, um, whether it's with the public libraries again or with classes on campus. Um, and then it was also a really nice thing because it had some nice internal within our library's response to seeing these objects online. And then working with, so I cataloged the maps for the university, but working with our metadata librarians on converting that map data into the metadata, something that doesn't exist for this type of material are actual subject headings. Um, so they kind of all will just get imaginary map. <laughs> but when you have 300 imaginary maps, this becomes an issue. So we're actually looking forward to a number of us are going to take the Wikidata Institute in September. Um, and one of our projects we're going to be using as our pilot project with that is going to be creating um, authority records in Wikidata for imaginary locations. Um, and we're pretty excited for this and we think it's something that will hopefully provide better access to that collection um, as Library of Congress is slower to move on creating subject headings for material they don't own. <laughs> um, so it's, it's spurring a lot of ideas and thoughts of how we can move to the future. And it was really interesting to kind of test to see how artists would react to asking for their material to be distributed online. Biggest concern was the downability, um, but I would hope moving forward in the future, there may be a way for us to look closer at that and have these material online so at least they could be viewed. So um, that's kind of where we're at with that. Uh, it was a simple project. It was a lot of fun to do. So thank you. Nice job, Sierra. This is incredibly creative. I hope that you are going to be presenting this um, at some conference venues because uh, I think it really has a place, uh, it has a strong place there. Um, I am very sad to hear that this will not be available permanently. Um, can you tell me uh, what the date is that you'll be taking this down, that you'll be unpublishing this? So that has not been determined yet. Um, it was kind of a internal discussion about <laughs> whether or not it's staying. Um, and so um, hearing this feedback, we might go back and see on our kind of project management team if we want to revisit that idea or not. But yeah, it has not been determined yet what day it'll come down. I hope at the very least that if you're under some bureaucratic pressure to unpublish it, and in fact, you only unpublish it and not delete it because you may find that six months or 12 months from now, um, it becomes compelling to republish. In addition, if you end up having the opportunity for um, what sadly I think will probably be a virtual conference presentation, but that opens the door to more in a way, um, you, you certainly would probably want to have that still uh, in a published state um, right. um, when, when you're presenting. So, um, and it's, yeah. it's one of those where I know part of the concern was we, 
it was built, oh man, it's going on YouTube. I'm just going to say it. It was built without um, following our own internally applied procedures and workflows. Um, so my real push for it would probably be, I would prefer to recreate it following the actual internal policy. So the images were not loaded. They're just straight in spotlight. We didn't put them into our normal server spaces. It was an incredible point of need, quick creation. Um, and so it was nice to see that I could do that, but there's nothing there that is backed up or saving this redundantly or having a preservation copy of that digital object. Um, so if the decision was made to go ahead and keep it, I think what I would really ask for is that ability to recreate it following our full workflow. Um, so that it hits all the checks and balances and matches the rest of our digital projects. Thank you. Thank you. Well, Kathy, we do have Sierra's boss on the line, so she got the word um, on the exhibit. <laughs> um, that, that, that's excellent. So I'll go ahead and stop the recording now. Great. What I was going to say, Michael, is that um, I did send a private message to Sierra that if she would like to keep it up, <laughs> do so. Now she wants Very to good. Outstanding. So 